In the world of quantum mechanics approximation schemes, the variational method is a clever way of not just computing, but to some degree optimizing an upper bound on the energy of the ground state of a system. So we can already see it's critically different from the perturbation theory that we covered before. First, it's not attempting to approximate the actual energy states, it's just giving us an upper bound, and it's doing it only on the ground state rather than any of them. Those two things might seem like a very serious drawback, but I promise promise this has a good value proposition. And the aspect that really makes the value proposition of this technique is that to use it you don't need to have access to a closely related exactly solvable problem, which you definitely do in perturbation theory. The idea of the variational method is this. We can prove that this quantity is greater than or equal to the true ground state energy, where these zero tilde states are our guess for the form of the ground state, so our basically intuition based guess on what function will roughly approximate what that ground state wave function would actually look like. As we'll see, the better our guess is, meaning the closer it is to the true wave function form, the closer our upper bound will get to the true energy ground state. And given that this quantity, for whatever guess we make, can't possibly drop below the true energy ground state, one will usually try many functions and select the one that produces the lowest value. And of course, in practice, this multi-step process will usually be mixed together with further intuition contributions as we see how well or badly our previous guesses seem to work at further reducing the upper bounds that this formula gives us. In fact, to some extent, we can even automate this process. If we've got a series of different functions that are related just by the variation of a parameter, then we can calculate this quantity for the general parameter and then just minimize it. Again, in practice, we'll often also try many different functional forms that aren't related by those parameters, but this can certainly help speed it up to some extent. With that introduction done, we now know what it is that we need to prove, namely this equation number one, and we can carry on with that. Regardless of our lack of knowledge of the exact energy eigenstates, we can still define them. They're still going to be the solutions to this eigenvalue problem with the quantum Hamiltonian, and we can claim reasonability in assuming that they form a complete basis in which any well-behaved function can be expanded, including our trial ground state. After all, we're developing a method to handle quantum problems that are hard to solve, at least exactly. We're not attempting to handle problems that violate the normal rules. By inserting this expansion we have into h-bar, we can construct a shockingly simple proof of number one. It does seem like a really bold statement that this particular small quantity would always be greater than or equal to e naught, but that doesn't mean hard to prove. Upon insertion, we immediately see a bunch of quantities that we know how to work with. This one is a Kronecker delta, of course, which allows us to do one of the sums, and this h will act on n by the definition given up here, leaving us with an energy eigenvalue and bringing these two states together, which give us another Kronecker delta, and allow us to do one of the sums in the numerator as well. That gets us immediately to here. From there, we can complete this proof by adding and subtracting the ground state energy, and then breaking the sum up into two terms and and studying what we get. At the end of the day, that leaves us with this equation, where we can set the lower bound equal to 1 here, because the zero term is vanishing anyway. We can see from this immediately that this equality must be true, because this is definitely positive, that's definitely positive, and this must also be positive. These en are only going to show up for cases of excited states, given this summed index equaling 1 or greater, and will therefore by definition be larger than this e naught here, leaving this all positive, or at least zero. And we can also see that the only way it does turn out to be zero is if we insert the true ground state for zero tilde, at which point we just get e naught for our answer, and we get the case of equality. From the last few steps here, we can also see that this quantity in the denominator here is necessary to account for the fact that any random functional form that we might guess isn't necessarily normalized. The form of this term in 2 here also makes it clear that a relatively poor trial ground state wave function, meaning not that great of a guess as far as its matchup with the true ground state, can give a surprisingly good upper bound. If the difference between the trial wave function and the true ground state is of order epsilon, then the upper bound will be off the true ground energy by epsilon squared because the trial function enters via mod squareds there.
Also, given that this term here only vanishes for the case of the true ground state wave function, h bar has a minimum at the true ground state, meaning its variation at the true ground state is zero. It's therefore common to hear people say that h bar is stationary under variation at the true ground state, and it's this statement of the theorem that we just proved that gives rise to the name variational method. Now that we understand what the variational method is, and we've proved it, it's illustrative to go through an example using an exactly solvable problem so that we actually have something to compare to. The easiest option, as far as I can tell, is the 1D infinite square well problem, so we'll play around with that one a little bit. Turns out that it's easiest to write down reasonable trial function guesses if we take the infinite potential well to be symmetric about the origin, which is perhaps the less common option. Usually we work with signs and have the potential well start at zero. But anyway, it's straightforward enough to write out the symmetric case. For the ground state solution specifically, we do just get this simple cosine function with zero outside the well, and then this famous ground state energy value, which is the same regardless. Given the form of the potential, even not knowing the exact solution, one might guess that the ground state would be some kind of single smooth hump, something close to a quadratic form like this. The physical reasoning behind that is that such a shape is a smooth this non-zero form that also satisfies the required boundary conditions, it's certainly a good place to start. If we turn the crank on the formalism that we developed above, we arrive at this value here, which we can then use some algebra to write in terms of the known ground state energy. Calculating out a few decimal places on this, we find that it is in fact very close to one. With that really simple guess, and this really simple formalism, we did actually get really close, and that's actually why this technique is worth studying. It isn't just pedagogically useful, it's also surprisingly effective. Now let's see if we can easily improve upon this. One way to try and improve on the simple quadratic guess is to optimize the exponent. We just guessed to because it seemed physically intuitive and relatively easy to work with, but let's say we don't try to guess the power. We just assume it's of some form roughly like this, and we calculate what power is best using that minimization technique that I mentioned at the beginning. Calculating h-bar for the arbitrary power makes for a bit of a longer calculation, but it is relatively doable. Probably the most important thing to remember when doing this is that we can replace the integration from negative l to l with two times the integration of zero to l, but the twos cancel because you do it in both the numerator and denominator, and that's basically because the integrands in both cases are even functions, so we're able to get away with that, and the integration bounds are also symmetric. From there, the integration is easier to handle than it otherwise would have been. If you want to check your work, you can pause the video, but getting through to the end here, we find this relatively simple result. We can then calculate the minimum by zeroing the derivative, as you usually do in calculus. We find this equation, which has two zeros, the only positive one of which is this. We can then and insert that into our h-bar to get the minimum value, and we've pushed the difference down by almost exactly one decimal place. This is amazingly close for such a simple technique, and what still is a pretty simple guess. And with that, you now understand the variational method for calculating an upper bound on the energy of the ground state of a quantum system. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.